Hello, I'm Karen Grease. I'm a director in our tax exempt services area, working with institutions of higher education and other not for profit organizations. What is the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA and why is it important? You know, the IRA or the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act is really an exciting time for our tax exempt and public sector entities. The goal of the IRA is to incentivize through tax credits and other opportunities, a transition to cleaner energy production and move away from our fossil fuels. You know, the IRA itself is the largest effort in U.S. history as we look at providing incentives or $500 billion in tax credits and direct funding to encourage the adoption of clean energy options, energy conservation, and other energy efficiencies. You know, most of the tax credits, when we think of the IRA, most of the tax credits themselves are available to qualifying projects until 2032. So we have an additional nine years in which to capture these opportunities that are under the IRA. While some existing tax credits have already been in place for some time, but there are new ones for specific types of energy sources, certain construction projects, certain clean energy programs, or even as we look at our electric electric vehicles, you know, having the opportunity to have a tax credit as it relates to placing in your fleet electric vehicles. The IRA itself also has over $40 billion in competitive loans and grant funding, which is available for clean energy and carbon reducing projects. So the act itself is quite expansive when we look at what it's doing to promote non-fossil fuels. How can public sector entities take advantage of IRA tax credits and incentives? You know, this is what's exciting about the IRA is that historically non-taxpayers, our tax exempt and public sector type clients have not had access to clean energy tax credits, which have been around for many years. Our for-profit brethren had the opportunity to take advantage of these credits, but again, they're available to us. The IRA changed that. And now those credits are open to us and we need to be looking at the opportunities that are before us. In addition to our clean energy credits, many tax exempt organizations and government entities are eligible for a direct pay provision under the act as a non taxpayer for qualifying clean energy projects that were, as I said, previously available only to for profit entities. You know, for example, a tax exempt entity could receive a payment of 30% of the cost of an electric vehicle, assuming certain qualifications do exist and certain limitations are met. In addition, tax exempt entities that construct clean energy capital projects, such as a solar project, may be eligible to receive a direct pay tax credit of 30% or more of the cost of the qualifying property that actually is in the project. So again, these are significant dollar amounts as we think about opportunities that are available to our clients. Gideon, do you want to talk about some of the details as far as qualifying for the credits? Sure. Thank you, Karen. And my name is Gideon Bradman. I help lead our energy and infrastructure group at Baker Tilly. Um, and as Karen was saying, the Inflation Reduction Act has a tremendous amount and type of, of tax credit funding available to qualified energy projects. And the question is, you know, how much of, a, of an incentive could this really be? And that really depends on the type of capital project uh, that you may be building. So an investment tax credit, which is a type of incentive under the tax code that was bolstered by the Inflation Reduction Act, is one area that has a big opportunity for taxpayers and non-taxpayers alike. And the amount of the credit that you might get on a qualifying project will depend on a number of factors. First and foremost, what are you building? Certain types of energy property, things like solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, as well as combined heat and power, and other types of qualified projects are specifically included as being available for the investment tax credit. And so you get a base credit for just having a, a qualifying type of project planned and built. Uh, in addition, the 
the Inflation Reduction Act took some specific policy uh, decisions by trying to favor and give more of a tax credit to the taxpayer or the non-taxpayer for doing some specific things. They specifically want to encourage the paying of prevailing wage and the development of apprenticeships. Uh, and so there is something called the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirement, which we'll talk about more later. And if you if you follow the uh, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, that is a significant multiplier to the value of your potential tax credit. Also, if your facility is located in what's called an energy community, which is a community that has historically had a lot of its um, its business income and tax revenue come from traditional energy industries like oil, gas, and coal. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act wants to give extra emphasis to those communities during the energy transition. So you would get an additional tax credit benefit for being in those areas. Similarly, if you're in an economically disadvantaged area or an environmental justice community, as it's called, those, those projects in those locations can also have extra tax credit benefit as part of these incentives. And what's also very interesting and important about the Inflation Reduction Act's enhancement of these tax incentives is that for the first time, uh, tax credits like these are now transferable. So historically, the taxpayer or the non-taxpayer who earned the tax credit needed to either self-consume them or have a tax partner in order to monetize the credits. But under the Inflation Reduction Act, these credits are now transferable where you can, tra where you can transfer and sell those credits to a third party. That allows more entities and more partners to be able to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits. Now, for nonprofits and non taxpayers like colleges and universities or cities and towns, you would be eligible for what's called the direct pay provision. So there's no need to sell the credit because you would be directly available to get the credit from the Treasury. But for taxpayers, this transferability provision is very important. The rules and the calculation of the amount of the incentives are complex and um, it'll depend very much on the specifics of the project. We help clients understand what they're eligible for and, um, and how they can best claim the maximum credit. What are some examples of how different types of entities can benefit from the IRA? Institutions of higher education are important uh, beneficiaries of a lot of these incentives as we've talked about. And more and more, we're speaking with colleges and universities about uh, a lot of their energy projects, which are very much eligible for tax credits under the Inflation Reduction Act. Some common examples on higher education campuses are things like upgrades to the central utility plant of a college or a university. Um, for example, many colleges and universities, especially older ones, have, have central utility plants that provide hot water, steam, and electricity in many cases throughout the campus. A campus is often run like a small town or a small city, and this is really the power plant at the heart of the campus. These facilities, when they need upgrading, can be very expensive, and many of them are what's called combined heat and power facilities, where you create both electricity and thermal energy at the same time. If an institution is upgrading or building a new combined heat and power facility, uh, these facilities are specifically eligible for the investment tax credit and are a great example of where you can have 30 or more percent of your eligible uh, costs of the plant uh, covered by the tax credits we're talking about here. Another good example is distributed electricity that's more and more being put in across different campuses. So that could be things like distributed solar, solar power on top of the roof of buildings or distributed wind power in rural areas where you may have high winds uh, or looking at distributed geothermal heating and cooling, which is more and more being looked at on campuses for heating and cooling supplement on a campus. All of those are eligible property under the investment tax credit and they too could qualify for 30% or more of their eligible costs to come back to you in a energy tax credit. What about some public sector examples? Hello, uh, it's Doug Baldessari, partner with uh, uh, Baker Tilly, where I serve as a municipal advisor to um, clients um, throughout the country. And uh, regarding public sector, there, there are many projects that um, are qualifying projects for the IRA tax credits. and. And what we're seeing a lot of right now is uh, so our solar projects are very popular and on, on top of municipal buildings or uh, adjacent to uh, utility treatment plants to reduce the energy costs in, in those facilities. Uh, we also see a lot of qualifying uh, biogas property project, uh, projects. 
for uh, upgrading biogas for wastewater treatment plants. Um, we see a lot of, uh, and you can use that in your operations um, or uh, the gas can be cleaned up and sold to the gas provider as renewable natural gas. Uh, and, and, and we also see a lot of geothermal projects right now for uh, heating and cooling uh, and uh, electric vehicles and charging stations are also hot. We also see similar projects that have been described with higher education. We're seeing a lot as it relates to solar on building rooftops or even ground installations of solar. We're seeing many projects where organizations are installing dynamic glass you know, changing out the windows for energy efficiency. In addition to the electric vehicles or electric vehicle charging stations, although some of the nuances of what we're seeing with those charging stations is you're eligible for the credits if the organization or the installation of those vehicles are within certain census tracts or other you know, designated areas. So just because you are putting in place an electric vehicle charging station does not mean that you're automatically eligible for the credit, but it is worth pursuing to see if there are opportunities. What is the eligibility framework for tax credits or direct funding that potential recipients need to be aware of? It's important to understand the framework uh, under which the Inflation Reduction Act gives its credits because the, the policy legislation that was enacted had specific policy goals and and those goals are reflected in the framework about which projects are eligible and how much of a credit is due for each type of project. First and foremost, certain types of energy property are eligible and certain types are not. The, the new law and the policy was focused on trying to accelerate the transition from traditional fossil fuel energy toward cleaner sources of energy throughout the economy. It's meant to be a transformational policy shift. And so certain types of energy plants are included to, uh, in the incentives. Things like solar, wind, fuel cells, geothermal, combined heat and power, microgrid controllers, uh, renewable natural gas and biogas. These are specific types of technologies that the law is trying to incent so that people build more of these facilities. So if you're building or plan to build one of those types of, of clean energy facilities, then you have the potential to qualify. And there's something called the base credit and the bonus credit. The base credit is enabled by being one of those types of properties I just listed. And generally, you qualify for what's called a 6% base credit for any of the eligible property types. Um, that's 6% of eligible costs. So generally, a project has a total cost, and within that, there are eligible costs, which are things that are specifically critical and integral to the production of energy or production of electricity. So most costs are included in a project, but not all costs. And that's something that we often help clients understand is, is how to segment which costs are eligible and which costs are not. Once you've met the requirement for the eligible property and the base credit, there are certain bonus criteria that are important to understand to see whether you can earn more of a credit than the base credit. First is the domestic content requirement. So the policy was very specific in trying to not only in incentivize clean energy production, but also to incentivize buying US domestic components for your energy project. The, the law is trying to give incentives for companies and, and not-for-profits to buy components of their energy project. So that are made in America. That could be made in America, solar panels or wind turbines or circuitry boards or fabricated equipment that go into the project's infrastructure. Uh, if you meet the domestic content requirements that are laid out in the law and that are being clarified by the Treasury Department, then you get the potential for an additional 2% base credit. On top of that, if you're in what's called an energy community, an energy community is a community that historically has been very, very much rooted and has a lot of its economy in traditional industries like oil, gas, and coal. The law recognizes that as clean energy transition happens, those communities can lose in the transition because their traditional fossil fuel communities, those fuels are going to be less popular. And over time, those communities would have less business. So the idea is that they would like to create an incentive for more clean energy projects to find their way into energy communities. So if your project happens to be in an eligible census tract in an energy community, um, then you get an additional 2% base credit as well. So initially you had six, 
you would have an extra 2% for domestic content, that's eight, and an extra 2% for energy community, that's 10%. Um, and then the overarching requirement or the overarching bonus factor is what's called the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirement. This is an acknowledgement that the federal government would like a lot of its significant um, incentive money to boost wages in the economy. And they're very focused on boosting uh, boosting labor wages for the construction and operation of these facilities. And so uh, in the law, if, if a project owner and developer commits to and can document that they paid federal prevailing wages in their location for all of the work done in constructing the project, as well as any work done in the alteration or repair of the project for the next five years uh, after the project goes into service, then you're eligible for the prevailing wage apprenticeship bonus, which is five times the amount of your base credit. So if previously you had a 6% base credit and you followed prevailing wage and apprenticeship, that boosts your credit to 30% of eligible costs. Similarly, if you had a domestic content requirement met, that 2% base credit turns into an extra 10% bonus credit. And similarly, if you're in an energy community, that 2% additional base credit becomes an additional 10% or five times two for the energy community bonus. As a result, you can see that as much of as much as 30 to 50% of the eligible costs could be eligible for a significant federal tax credit. Finally, there's something called the environmental justice criteria for wind and solar projects. It only applies to wind and solar and it's a competitive bonus. But there too, if you're in an, an economically disadvantaged community, you can apply to potentially get an additional 10 or 20% of your eligible costs additionally added to your investment tax credit. So as you can see, there's a tremendous opportunity here for having a significant amount of the eligible costs of your energy project covered by this tax credit. So it's important as you look at your projects that may be eligible, that you understand what you may be eligible for and how that may apply in your specific situation for your specific project. This is something that Baker Tilly often helps clients with to understand what you may be eligible for and how you can best maximize your credit. It's also important to, to note that there are time requirements for the, uh, the incentives under the Inflation Reduction Act as well. While this is at least a 10-year tax credit regime, there is particular emphasis to try to accelerate the beginning of construction for these projects as soon as possible. So in the law, there is an advantage to having your project begin construction between now and the end of 2024 and come into service shortly thereafter. If you're able to meet that begun construction requirement, um, you're able to maximize the, the credit available. After December 31st, 2024, there is a slight change in modification in which types of projects are eligible. And so it's important to do your best to accelerate the beginning of those projects where possible. What are the essential next steps for organizations to maximize their savings with the IRA? There are many variables for an organization to consider when determining the optimal tax credit grant and loan funding mix for a project. Uh, with so much funding out there available right now uh, through the IRA and other federal programs, state programs, uh, it's important to develop a plan with your financial advisor to make sure you're maximizing the funding and incentives for your projects. It's also important to note that although there has been additional guidance provided recently regarding these tax credits, uh, we're still waiting on federal agencies to release additional significant guidance, which could provide additional information regarding these tax credits and how it can affect you. You want to evaluate your project landscape. Um, look at your prior projects, current projects, and future projects. I mean, if you had a project previously that didn't make financial sense and it was a qual, you think it was a qualifying project, it's probably a good good idea to take a a, a new look at it now and. You know, analyzing how these tax credits could change that answer. If you have a current project that didn't factor into uh, it, the uh, tax credits uh, that are available now, well, you should relook at that project and see how that might change your answer. And then if you have future projects planned, uh, make sure you include the IRA tax credit analysis in, in those future projects. Also, for deferred maintenance and other capital projects that involve energy efficiency, renewable energy, and other eligible components, it's important to factor in the IRA and how that could affect things. If your uh, organization has an environmental, social, and governance strategy, 
that could be furthered by this project that would qualify for tax credits, grants, loans under the IRA, uh, you want to take that into consideration. Also, uh, we have a community mapping tool that can help college, university, public sector entity, or even a not-for-profit organization to locate areas for projects that will qualify for the tax credits, direct payments. Baker Tilly has a significant amount of information in our IRA Resource Center. Go to our website and take a look at that information as it will be very helpful for you um, related to the IRA and, and guidance that's out so far. We're here to help guide you through your IRA journey. Contact us with any questions about how to maximize your IRA opportunity.